best of the rest of the news. Microsoft is billing Windows 10, its new operating system, as the future. But what kind of future is the question many tech and privacy experts have been asking ever since the first shipments hit the shelves in late July. Although the ads from Windows 10 feature smiling babies and happy families, many are skeptical of this operating system. Why? Well, for starters, its privacy statement includes a paragraph that gives Microsoft the right to snoop on your data. It says that Microsoft will access, disclose, and preserve personal data, including your content, such as the content of your emails, other private communications, or files in private folders when we have a good faith belief that doing so is necessary. End of quote. And that's just the beginning. Some even argue that the entire operating system is one giant piece of spyware. So does this mean that Windows 10 is just one more link in the chain dragging us to 1984? Or is the situation a bit more complicated than that? Joining me now from Portland, Oregon for more on this is writer Gaius Publius. So Gaius, welcome back first of all to the program. Thank you very much, Tom. Thanks for joining us. So what's your take on this whole controversy? Is Microsoft 10 spyware? Uh, it is spyware, yes. Uh, I would. That's my personal evaluation. There are other people who disagree, but it's really hard to look at the facts and not see it that way. It is not, as your uh, teaser uh, once stated, includes spyware. It actually is designed as spyware. Microsoft, as you, uh, thank you for reading that statement, by the way. It saves me from having to. Microsoft Windows 10 can monitor everything you do online and offline, including, as you noted, with your private folders, your personal folders. It can disclose all of this to partners, and that means trusted partners, advertising partners. Who the heck is, are these partners? They're undefined. Uh, it can create, it will create an advertising ID for you, a personal unique identifier, and will share that identifier with you, with advertisers as you move from platform to platform. So for example, your, your laptop to your tablet to your smartphone. It will sync all of your settings by default. You can't stop it. It will upgrade itself by default. You can't stop it. It will communicate information from itself to Microsoft even after all of its settings that say stop communicating are turned off. That was fascinating in a study done by Ars Technica on uh, October 18th they published a piece called even when told not to Windows 10 just can't stop talking to Microsoft. Wow. They put it on a test bed they turned off everything that would make it communicate and it was communicating anyway. A lot of the communication they could understand but some of it they couldn't. So this is a really interesting design. This basically puts you on a VAX uh, terminal or an IBM mainframe, basically, back in those IBM mainframe days before the PC revolution, except you kind of have the belief that you've got your personal computer like you used to. You don't. Yeah. So uh, the, 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 the cliche, I suppose is the right word, has been that when the product is free, the product is you. Um, you know, Facebook is free, and what do they do? They take all your personal preferences, everything you like, they combine that information, sell it to advertisers and say, oh, here's a guy who likes bunnies, here's a guy who likes, you know, breasts or whatever. I mean, fill in the blanks. And, and uh, you're the product. Um, arguably, the same thing with the Chrome browser. Uh, you know, Google gives it away, and yet they're keeping very, very careful track of everything you do. How is this any different? Isn't this just the new normal? Well, it's the new normal, but we have to understand that it's, it's, it's taking normal to a, a, an order of magnitude greater degree. The ability to profile based on behavior is, as is, is orders of magnitude more sophisticated than most people realize. Just as the ability to mimic food by creating taste on a substrate and making it feel and taste like things that you recognize is actually, in the food industry, orders of magnitude more sophisticated than people realize. To take your Facebook example, for, uh, for example, a couple of years ago, people who weren't sure that they were gay were getting Facebook ads targeted to gay users. And at some point they realized, oh, Facebook thinks I'm gay. 
And then they realized, oh, but I am. I'm about to come out. I'm coming to terms with that now. Facebook had figured it out before they were by using their profile algorithms. These algorithms are extremely sophisticated. And the, the final thing is you, you Microsoft says you can turn all this stuff off if you don't accept the default settings, which of course everybody will do. But the turning off the communication, which I think is an incomplete fix, doesn't stop the creation of the profile itself. Hmm. And I think if they build it, they will use it. Yeah. So the alternative, we just have 30 seconds here, guys, Publius. The alternative is just to stay with your old Windows 7 or 8 or whatever it is? In two sentences, stay with Windows 7 until you have to upgrade. When you upgrade, switch to Linux, like Linux Mint is the one I'm hearing the mess most about. It's actually, it, you, can, you can switch to Linux and not lose 99% of what you do already. Remarkable. Guys, Publius, thanks so much for being with us. Um, Dick Cheney was on CNN the other night talking about the Iraq war. Check out what he had to say. Any regrets about going into Iraq? No, it was the right thing to do then. I believed it then, and I believe it now. No apologies. No apologies. Your thoughts on this? Dick Cheney should go away. Dick Cheney has become a profane, an obscene blemish on the American reputation. Dick Cheney in 1998, as CEO of Halliburton, for example, said dramatically that sanctions don't work. He wanted the sanctions on Iran lifted. He wanted to do business with Iran. Now, all of a sudden, Dick Cheney is not just for sanctions. He's for discarding the Iran agreement and essentially going back to sanctions, even more draconian sanctions. Dick Cheney is, in a word, an idiot. Yeah, well, and in, in, I thought in 99 that Halliburton was even doing backdoor deals with Probably with so, and, probably so, yeah. under Dick Cheney's CEO ship. Yeah, yeah. Um, you, you seem quite uh, emphatic about that. Do you, I'm do as you, emphatic about that as anything that, that confronts and challenges and damages this country today. I wish Dick Cheney and his daughter Liz would go away. I realize that we have a constitution and a bill of rights and it says they have a right to do whatever they want to, but I'm frankly concerned because Dick Cheney ought to be in jail for war crimes. And if he were, and if accountability were really achieved in this country, we wouldn't have to listen to him except through prison bars. Wow. Do you think that, that your old boss Colin Powell has similar feelings? I won't that, speak for General Powell. He's a lot you, more calm and equitable. Do you think he, others <laughs> like you who are in the administration who knew these characters feel this way? I, th I know there's some. I know there's some at the CIA even who are very angry that no accountability has been achieved over the issue of torture yeah. and that we are still frosting over, color coding, collating, whatever, these reports that are coming out about what the CIA did and didn't do. Amazing stuff. Colonel, thank you so much for being with us. Thanks for having me. President Obama, Obama with 34 officially votes. changed the name of the mountain formerly known as Mount McKinley to his traditional Alaskan native name of Denali. And there, there actually is a segue here. Just hang on. After the announcement, this right-wing meme surfaced claiming that Denali is the Kenyan word for black power. I mean, some racist just literally made this up and threw it out on, on uh, uh, Facebook where it's gone completely viral. And according to a new poll from public policy polling, the majority of Republicans, 54 percent, still believe that Barack Obama is a Muslim, and an additional 32 percent aren't sure whether he's a Muslim or a Christian, and only 29 percent of Republicans think that Obama was born in the United States. Only 29 percent. Welcome back to tonight's Progressive Roundtable. Still with me, Ari Rabenhoff. Kai Newkirk and Eric Altieri. And uh, the vulture capitalists are scavenging Baltimore at a frightening pace. The Wall Street hedge fund Fortress Investment Group and Los Angeles-based Imperial Capital have been buying up people's small debts and then charging those people predatory interest rates on those very same debts. Debt is frequently f for as little as $250 and or as few as $250, it's a little as, all of the above, anyway, as small as. And frequently the debt is uh, simply an unpaid water bill or property taxes. Hedge funds then turn the debt around to reap an 18% interest, according to a Baltimore research-based uh, Baltimore based research group, the Abel Foundation. In the end, if families can't pay, they simply lose their homes to the vulture capitalists. According to one analysis in 2014, the evicted families had lived in their homes for an average of 21 years. Half of the people evicted were elderly, more than a third were disabled, and the majority were African-American. So how do we put an end to this?
practice and protect the most vulnerable in our society from this kind of predatory banking. Any suggestions? I mean, do we? And Nixon did away with the usury laws up until the 70s, early 70s. It was against the law to charge more than 10 percent interest in the United Which States. Which is what this should be called, right? Yeah, usury. Yeah. We should be call, that, calling this usury. Okay. I mean, the unfortunate thing is we do need a real answer to this. Uh, we're seeing this happen across the country. Uh, it happened in Ferguson, where they bought up a lot of the homes, and then they were renting them back, sometimes then leaving the properties to fall apart. We saw it in Detroit, where they basically shut down everyone, all the normal citizens' water in that state because of some overdue water bills. Uh, well, in all these places, you have companies who are avoiding their taxes uh, for, to the tune of millions of dollars. But these hedge fund managers and those people in the banking industry are basically bringing back what is the you know, new millennium's version of redlining and finding a way to keep these people that are already suffering and impoverished down. And we do need some real legislation to come through Congress to really address this because it's unacceptable. Rather than blocking folks out of the neighborhoods, they're going into the neighborhoods and the, ripping them off. The water thing in Baltimore is particularly egregious um, because, so there were about 40, 43 to 45 million dollars in unpaid water bills in Baltimore. And uh, a plurality of them came from a few hundred businesses. So I had the head of the Baltimore Water District on my program, the head of PR there. And I said, and they said, we're going to start collecting and shutting people's water off and doing this stuff. And I said, well, are you doing this to the businesses first? Because there's one hedge fund guy who owns, I, I, it's one of the largest properties in the Hamptons, a uh, $100 million property in the Hamptons, who he had owned a steel factory in Baltimore that owes millions, literally of that, I think it was five or six million dollars, was, hmm. his, was his debt. Right. No, that's, that's written off. I said, are you going to try to collect from these businesses? Who owe tons of money before you go after people, and they said, "Well, we're going after people. You know, we, we don't we don't make choices like that. That's not efficient." And I said, "They said I said, how many people are you going after?" And they said, "A few hundred." I said, "How many of them are the businesses? Zero." And then, and okay, so you're making choices to go after these people. And then there was a story I don't know if you saw it in the Washington Post about this company that's going into Baltimore. People had these were poisoned in their homes by lead, sued and won settlements. And this company's going in and tricking people into getting pennies on the dollar for their settlements, including Freddie Gray, by the way, mm -hmm. was one of the people. And a judge is sitting there approving them. And I Googled the judge because I wanted to see. Same judge had a profile in the New York Times about a year ago because he was giving tough sentences to kids, putting, them in, putting black kids in prison who did not belong in prison, who everyone said didn't belong in prison. Well, you wonder if they were private prisons. And <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that, that's the first thing I, I jumped to. Yeah, but, <laughs> you know, let's be real because, you know, when I hear about this, it sounds pretty clear. It's immoral and it should be illegal, yeah. right? But this isn't the first time that Wall Street banks have harmed people in our country. Mm. It was just a few years ago they crashed the economy. And what happened? Were they held accountable? Were the banks broken up? No. Did any bankers go to jail? No. They got bailed out while people lost their homes, retirements, and jobs. And at the time we were debating Wall Street reform, Dick Durbin, who's no radical, said the banks own the place. Mm. And they still own the place in terms of Congress, right? right. And until that changes, we're not going to stop this. We're not going to prevent another uh, crash like has happened. We have to be honest when we talk about the problems in our country. We have to be honest that the, solution, the, the system for fixing them is broken. It's fundamentally corrupt. And until we change that, we're not going to be able to make progress. On so that. you've got on the Democratic side Donald Trump, on the Republican side sort of in a little bit of a way, uh, maybe Donald, excuse me, on the Democratic side Bernie Sanders, on the Republican side uh, Donald Trump, talking about some of these um, inconvenient truths, to paraphrase Al Gore. When are we going to start, I mean the consensus here is that we need to change our laws, which takes yeah. Congress. When are we going to start seeing members of Congress who are running for election or for re-election start talking the way that, you know, start talking about this, this, this blunt stuff about, hey, it's time to break up the big banks, for example. When it's people time. get in the streets yeah. and start disrupting their events, start disrupting their fundraisers and start creating a crisis in their, this country that can't be ignored. We saw what two people could do in Seattle, yeah. right? that stood up and spoke the inconvenient truth that black lives matter and that everyone needs to listen to it. And Bernie Sanders, if he's going to be the, the champion of the progressive movement, that he's got to lift that up. You know? So what, what could we do if so many of the people who agree with everything that we're saying on this show right now were willing to step up and make some sacrifices like that? I think, I think that's when we'll see the it. Confluence of events we've been talking about uh, between you know, Citizens United, uh, 
these banks really owning these politicians. It's even kind of simpler than that. In the face of all this, the American people need to stand up and they need to vote. Our voter turnout is abysmal. And if these people can get away, which is scooting into office on the, lo the thinnest of margins on low voter, voter turnout in gerrymandered districts with their entire campaigns bankrolled by the large financial institutions, nothing's ever going to change. But I think people we aren't vote voting because they, they figure th the, the game is real. Well, that's not part of That's the challenge. And, and by the way, you know, we said, somebody said we need to change laws. The problem is we actually don't need to change some laws. Like there was a policy at the Justice Department that said, you know, if a bank could cause catastrophic injury to the economy, we won't prosecute them, which is why HSBC literally committed, uh, laundered money for, had a window at the bank for laundering money for terrorists and drug dealers, right. and we said we're not prosecuting them. The laws are on the books in a lot of cases to yeah. prosecute these people. Uh, this administration, the previous administration, chose not to prosecute a number of them. Yeah, and that's, that's ultimately what it comes down to, tragically.